Okay. Can you? There we go. I think you're going to be okay now. Okay, there. Now it's on. Okay. And it's already synced, so you don't have to do and, um, So now that we are recording, I will be introducing our presenter, um, Sarah Hunter. She's been studying and working in the field of alternative and complementary medicine since 1999. Her passion was lit with herbal medicine, which then naturally progressed into midwifery. She's certified by the North American Registry of Midwives. She's been working with pregnant families since 2004. Her view of illness and wellness is filtered through her understanding of traditional Chinese medicine. Sarah also pursues a variety of related interests, including managing two small businesses and volunteering as an online community manager for MANA. So we would prefer if you hold your questions until the end of the presentation. And without further ado, I will turn to my Sarah. Hi, guys. I'm super happy to be here uh, again this year. I've really enjoyed this conference in the past. Um, I love the international issues, and uh, I've just heard so many excellent uh, presenters over the years. And I really hope um, that I uh, um, I make it up to my own standards. <laughs> so forgive me. I'm usually uh, I don't look like a nervous person, but I am. <laughs> so if I talk too fast, forgive me. <clears throat> if you can't understand, um, ask me to clarify. And we'll do questions at the end. So uh, human placentophagy. Let's start with uh, primal needs. Um, I originally thought the word primal came directly from the word primate, but as it turns out, both the word primal and primate come from uh, the uh, root primus, meaning first. And uh, to start off on a good foot here on the right is a primate placenta. It's a orangutan placenta from this lovely website that you should be able to click on and go and visit. And I'll also have the resource at the end of the presentation as well. <clears throat> so of more than uh, 4,000 terrestrial mammal species in the subclass Eutheria, which means uh, placenta having um, only a handful of these, including camelids and humans, have been identified as a species that do not regularly engage in this behavior. Uh, however, um, some uh, I'm kind of here to dispel that. I do think uh, humans have regularly con um, consumed their placentas. Uh, but we'll get to that in a second. <clears throat> so the researchers have um, come up with a bunch of ideas why. Um, mammals would eat their placentas. Uh, some ones that get tossed around a lot are here on the slide. To keep the nest area sanitary, uh, to reduce odors that might attract predators to the birth site, to replenish nutritional losses that occurred during like pregnancy or delivery. This one stands out a lot for me. Uh, to acquire hormones present in the afterbirth. We'll deal with that quite a bit. Um, to respond to a general hunger. <laughs> After all, it's right there. Um, or my personal favorite um, is the express a tendency at partuition towards temporary voracious carnivorousness. I don't know about you, but I never felt temporarily voraciously carnivorous postpartum, but it's not outside of the realm of possibility. Um, so to me, the question is not really why, but rather why not? Uh, and I think the answer is our modern values. Uh, there are many taboos that surround um, placentophagy. Um, different um, uh, peoples uh, decided that the placenta was um, um, taboo to eat at a certain point in history. Um, and modern, in modern times, we definitely consider it gross. If you talk to a random person on the street, or if you put it into Google like I did there and you see my screenshot, you will see that people think it's gross. It's disgusting. It's gross. It's cannibalism. Don't do it. <clears throat> I'm just going to check my notes here for a second. Okay. Um, so the researchers are always saying that they can't find any evidence of uh, human placentophagy. I apologize for the formatting of this uh, slide. Uh, things go off when you put them in to uh, the Adobe meeting here. 
Um, so taboos in and of themselves are generally formed against likely behaviors or those that are recognized as possible, not against behaviors that are exceedingly unlikely. So Mark Crystal is one of the big researchers of um, mammalian placentophagy and uh, that's his line from one of his studies. Um, <clears throat> so it, it's recognized as, yes, there's a taboo for it because it has been done. Um, for example, there's no taboo against eating rocks. If you put eating rocks into Google, you don't come up with the, the same um, uh, kind of response. <clears throat> we do know, even Mark Crystal knows, in some cultures, uh, the placenta has been saved for subsequent medicinal applications. Um, we see a couple examples on this slide. And then um, the... Uh, <clears throat> And then uh, we jump straight to blaming the hippies as usual. <laughs> so this quote is from um, uh, a couple of different sources, but basically um, verified consumption of the placenta by the mother, however, has been sporadically reported from the 1970s to the present uh, among a small number of clients of midwives and alternative health advocates in the US and Mexico I would add in here too, here in Canada as well, um, and people claim therapeutic benefits, and I guess that's why we're here today, is to discuss what's happening now. <clears throat> uh, I'm checking my notes. So let's discuss the earliest written accounts. Um, it, the first, whoops, it's getting super small. My slides are super small on my side, I'm not sure why. Guys, oh, it's better. Um, the first written account of uh, placenta used medicinally is uh, from a book called the Ben Cao Gang Mu, and I apologize if I'm pronouncing that badly. Uh, written in the 16th century, so there, there's a pretty good history, <laughs> uh, a really good written history, in fact. And again, I apologize for the formatting of this. Uh, um, the British Medical Journal also has an article in 1917 which references both uh, current usage at that time in different cultures as well as earlier um, publications of placentophagy. Um, and then I found this lovely book here that you see uh, on the bottom right called, it's a French book, it's called Remedies of the Past, How Our Fathers Healed Themselves. So it's a book about uh, the remedies that had previously been used. And it was written, uh, itself was written in 1905, um, and uh, it was written by a doctor, Cabanes, who speaks of heated, dried, and pulverized placenta for various things, including after pains, hemorrhage, wound healing, um, to establish lactation and for postpartum recovery, um, uh, and as well as cat placenta <laughs> used for fertility, for human fertility. So these, uh, these usages come up over and over again. So uh, specifically lactation, uh, fertility, wound healing, um, postpartum hemorrhage. Um, <clears throat> there's a lovely quote in there which I'll read to you in French and then translate. C'est un usage qui est vieux comme le monde, que celui de manger des placentas. It means this usage is as old as the world, eating placentas. So this is totally not unheard of. Let's uh, take a dip into traditional Chinese medicine uh, for a second. So in traditional Chinese medicine, it's called Zihichi, and I'm sure I'm pronouncing that very badly as well, the pharmaceutical name being Placenta hominis. Uh, the literal English translation of that would be Purple River Vehicle, which is, uh, I guess, a beautiful reference to the vessels. Um, they speak of it entering the liver, lungs, and kidneys, as well as uh, tonifying the liver and kidneys and augmenting the essence, also known as the jing. Also tonifying the qi blood and the yang. The indications um, that are commonly still used today, um, in fact, you can get uh, human placenta pills or something at least marked as human placenta pills in Chinatown where I live, and uh, probably where you live too. Uh, and they've used it for chronic weakness and debility, which I think plays into anemia, or maybe is just directly translated to Western thought as anemia. Um, wheezing due to deficient lungs is a common one that comes up again in traditional Chinese medicine, a uh, lot of lung indications, 
deficient liver and kidneys, promotion of lactation, which I'm going to bring up again, so uh, pay attention here, lactation promotion, <clears throat> as well as uh, dermatological disorders, uh, including ulcerations and infertility, uh, as well as impotence. Uh, so modern, modern values and modern um, preparations. So what is it that your placenta lady does? <clears throat> what does your placenta lady do? So most placenta ladies, and I apologize again for the formatting, uh, spend uh, their time doing capsules. Um, there's a lot of other things. As, as many placenta ladies are out there, um, there are different products you can make out of the placenta. People are pretty creative with it. But generally, it looks like capsules, uh, tinctures, not unlike an herbal tincture, uh, salves uh, for the skin, uh, smoothies, people do a preparation of uh, small pieces of placenta uh, in a blender with fruit, uh, immediately postpartum, as well as prints, which is like an art print, and homeopathic remedies. <clears throat> There are, generally speaking, two categories of ways that placentas are prepared in uh, modern, modern day, including the raw pre preparation method. The um, raw preparation method, <clears throat> sorry, I'm going to look back at my notes here. Uh, the raw preparation method is, of course, because of the raw food movement that believe that raw foods have higher nutrient values than foods that have been cooked. Um, and so people who subscribe to that as a general way of life or a more serious way of life <clears throat> also are more interested in having their placenta prepared that way. And then the other way is uh, often called the TCM or traditional Chinese medicine uh, preparation method where the placenta is cooked usually by steaming prior to dehydration. Uh, herbs are often used in the steam water. There's sometimes there's confusion that goes uh, goes with this. <clears throat> sometimes people misunderstand that there are herbs put in the capsules with the placenta, but that is usually not done. Of course, modern um, placenta encapsulation is not exactly regulated, so what one person does may not be what another placenta lady does. <clears throat> so. <clears throat> Let's look at um, what does your placenta lady do. Most placenta ladies abide by strict infection control guidelines. Most of us are well thought out, have done uh, research, or have uh, histories um, knowing about infection control. Um, most of us also subscribe to local food safety guidelines. Some people have food handler cards. Um, a lot of thought goes into this. What does your placenta lady do? That much I can't really tell you. <clears throat> so does your placenta lady abide by the strict, strict infection control guidelines? I don't know. So can you ensure safety if your clients are looking to eat their placentas via encapsulation? Um, that I can't, I can't really speak to your lady in particular. I think uh, should you recommend encapsulation? That really depends on you. Um, and your personal feelings about it. However, uh, I'm pretty sure that, um, <clears throat> at least in this part of the world, more and more women are wanting placenta encapsulation, and it's definitely going to be something that comes up in your practice if it hasn't already. Um, and it, I think it's worth investigating or at least having a discussion with your local placenta lady or ladies about what their food safety and infection control guidelines are. Um, anyone who has put enough thought into it is going to be more than happy to discuss it with you. So you can make a, a decision about whether or not you want to recommend someone specifically or at least not recommend against it. <clears throat> of course, we can talk about that um, more in detail uh, during the question period. Um, an interesting comparison would be to uh, uh, a tattoo artist or a piercer. <clears throat> if somebody sees that you have a piercing or a tattoo, would you recommend them uh, to go see yours or just go see some random tattoo or artist around the corner? And I think uh, I think most people would feel more comfortable um, having had a discussion and uh, looked at the autoclave the tattoo artist is using back in the day. Uh, those people weren't regulated either, and now they've self-regulated. 
and I, the placenta ladies are kind of going in that direction as well. Um, okay. Sorry, I'm just flipping through my notes. Modern medical use. I'm using the word modern and medical together. I just mean <clears throat> medicine in a broad sense and modern meaning today. <coughs> Sorry, I'm grabbing some water here. So this is a, um, a thing that comes up uh, fairly regularly in midwifery circles. Um, depending on where your circles are, I imagine, <laughs> it comes up in my circles anyway, is people speaking about uh, using placenta f um, to stop postpartum hemorrhage in the immediate postpartum. Um, I believe the only reference I could find to it was from Robin Lim's 2010 book, and that's also in the references uh, later. And she speaks of five cases where her first line, oxytocin, did not work. And she successfully stopped um, postpartum hemorrhage with a piece of placenta coated in honey. Um, and as we saw, there is some historical usage of um, placenta for uh, uterine hemorrhage. Uh, currently, human placental extracts are also used for uh, burns, chronic ulcers, and other skin defects in um, mainstream medicine. And even more mainstream is the amniotic membrane usage um, as a transplant in ophthalmology. And this, in fact, if you if you uh, look around for it, is is quite common. It seems to be uh, well accepted, <coughs> relatively speaking. So in 2013, I can't see if my slide actually shows the number 2013, but yes, this is uh, the pie chart, and the slide is all based on a 2013 study at uh, UNLV. Excuse me. Um, it's women's self-reported um, experiences with uh, placenta um, encapsulation or just general in ingestion, placenta phagy in general. And so they were asked, among other things, why do you want to ingest your placenta? The, uh, as you see here, most women came back with uh, to improve mood. Um, there's a lot of talk of placenta encapsulation, placenta phagy um, being used as a preventative method for, post, um, for postpartum depression. Um, the next up is unspecified benefits, <laughs> followed by it was recommended by somebody else. Um, <clears throat> And then I'll let you read the rest of it yourself. Aid in recovery from birth, improved lactation. Um, people also came up with things like to increase their iron. It's a natural behavior. Of course, encapsulation in and of itself is a natural behavior. The eating of the placenta, however, is. Uh, other people spoke of um, weight loss um, and uh, they're just plain curiosity. The non-human studies um, about postpartum uh, placenta phagy uh, have come up with some interesting um, um, things. Uh, they've noted that placenta phagy offers pain-relieving properties in rats <coughs> via uh, an active su substance called uh, placental opioid, op opioid enhancing factor. And um, that, again, is uh, Mark Crystal in 2011. Um, they also noticed uh, the most interesting thing here for me is the increase of the interaction between the mother and infant uh, and the animals that ate their placentas versus the animals that did not eat their placentas. <clears throat> I don't know if that would potentially uh, cross over to be an explanation for um, uh, prevention of postpartum depression, um, but there it is. So the and here we go again with the uh, placental opioid enhancing factor. Uh, <clears throat> it cre it potentiates the pregnancy mediated analgesia in delivering mother, um, as well as suppressing postpartum pseudo pregnancy, which I haven't really uh, noticed happening in humans. I don't know. <laughs> If that's a thing or not, it's never come up in my book. 
<clears throat> and I see a question here, and I am not aware if the placental opioid enhancing factor has been found in humans. I have no idea. There's not really a huge uh, amount of research that uh, um, goes along with um, a modern day um, placentophagy, but there's definitely a lot of interesting things coming up, and uh, we'll get to that in a bit too. <clears throat> so, reported and suspected benefits. Again, this is from the self reported um, benefits um, study at UNLV in 2013. Um, <clears throat> You'll see in the pie chart that um, the 40% uh, say that it improved their mood, uh, followed by increased energy at 26%, improved lactation at 15%, 7% say it alleviated bleeding, and the 12% is other uh, kind of unspecified <clears throat> uh, benefits. Uh, why? <clears throat> Some hypothesize that placentophagy offers health and nutritional benefits by replenishing depleted bodily stores, including both vitamin B6 and bioavailable iron, um, both of which are associated with uh, depression <clears throat> when they are deficient. Hormone content, that lovely molecule you see there is estradiol. And again, we've got some water. So this was a fun study that I came across the first uh, four points on this slide where they actually um, measured the hormone content in cooked um, dried placenta, which is exactly what we do. Um, and what they came up with were uh, these four hormones, estradiol, progesterone, testosterone, and growth hormone. It's kind of an unspecified growth hormone. Um, and um, the quantities are there. These are very, very small quantities of hormones, but they are there. Um, as well as human placental lactogen and a bunch of other things such as oxytocin, relaxin, inhibitin, activin, beta endorphin, uh, endorphin and <coughs> beta lipotrophin. Uh, on to nutrients. A lot of nutrients have been found in um, placenta. Trace elements you can see there in their um, and their quantities in micrograms per gram based on the wet weight, so not cooked. Uh, some researchers, researchers in 1983 discuss uh, the B vitamin um, um, in uh, placenta, including uh, riboflavin, thiamine, and peroxidine. And some others found uh, really uh, small amounts of um, essential fatty acids. Negative effects. So again, these are the self-reported um, um, negative effects of placentophagy from the 2013 UNLV study. <clears throat> unpleasant taste or smell, including unpleasant belching. <laughs> so if, if <laughs> the vast majority of people reported there were no negative effects. I think if uh, unpleasant taste or smell is uh, your your uh, worst uh, effect, then we're doing pretty good. And more importantly for me, um, is four percent of people reported headache. So uh, that's a real side effect. If people are taking placenta capsules and they're having problems with headaches, it might be time to stop, at least temporarily, or diminish um, the quantity they're taking in a day. Other negative effects are at the bottom here. Difficulty remembering to take capsules, increased uterine cramping, increased vaginal bleeding, a limited supply of capsules, <coughs> and digestive difficulties. Oops, went too fast. Contraindications. <coughs> um, this is by no means complete. <laughs> Uh, we, like I said, there's a, there's not a whole huge uh, amount of research that's available. There's a historical references um, to a lot of things, but um, what we what we know is very little compared to what we could know. Um, and from a TCM point of view, uh, deficient yin 
is a definite contraindication, which includes uh, having an active infection, like a mastitis or something. Um, from a TCM perspective, it kind of goes without saying <clears throat> that a full gang would also be a contraindication. <clears throat> Excuse me. Bensky, Gamble, and Kapchuk, that's a TCM text, also talk about prolonged usage, although they don't describe what they mean by prolonged, although that's interesting considering what we are doing these days um, with placenta encapsulation being taken <coughs> Excuse me, over longer periods of time. Chorioamnionitis is uh, well accepted as a reason to not encapsulate the placenta uh, for obvious reasons. And then uh, if this, the, um, the placenta has been stored properly, imp improperly stored before uh, transformation is, proper, is possible, <coughs> excuse me, that's a definite uh, contraindication. This is from like a food uh, safety uh, standards point of view. The last line is dot, 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 because it's definitely unfinished. There are probably many more contraindications, and we're, we don't really know about them yet. I'm sure they will reveal themselves. <laughs> uh, questions and controversies. I'm going to jump right into a, kind of a big one. <coughs> um, this slide is about uh, the, the rumor uh, going around the placenta encapsulation um, forums. Um, about Jack Newman um, not uh, not being um, a proponent for placenta phagy. Um, so I went ahead and asked him how he felt about it, and because of this, um, I figured it would be something that came up uh, today during the presentation. And for a quote, and this is what he sent me. He says, "I don't think we are 100% against the taking of placental capsules." <laughs> <clears throat> but the notion does not make sense to me. If the placenta capsules contain the hormones of pregnancy, they are likely going to interfere with the milk supply, as do birth control pills. If they do not contain hormones, what is the reason for taking the capsules? And no one has ever been able to give me a logical reason. So <clears throat> I think that's a, um, a logical question from uh, Jack Newman. <clears throat> um, I'll deal with the hormones again on the next slide, and then we've covered them very briefly in the past. Uh, I also hope at this point in my presentation, people understand at least what the reason is for people to want to ingest their placenta. And uh, yeah, on the next slide, I'll deal with that. Uh, Edith Kernerman is an IBCLC who works with Jack. She also wrote me back <coughs> and uh, has a very interesting concern as well. She says, quote, my concern is that women are taking these capsules at the wrong time. If they're attempting to mirror what happens with some mammals, though so certainly not all, then placenta should be consumed immediately after birth. And then the desired hormonal effects might make sense before the onset of lactogenesis too. But to draw this out for days or weeks, I believe is problematic, <coughs> especially if they do have the intended hormonal impact. My worry is that these hormones will then affect the milk supply. Sorry, I'm wetting my throat again. Um, I think this is a, definitely an avenue for further research that needs to be done. It's a very valid question. Um, what we have is the historical usage is that placenta has been used for insufficient lactation. Um, if it's been used for insufficient lactation, it's at the point where we already know that lactation is insufficient, which is to say after secondary lactogenesis. <clears throat> So historically, um, that has been, been an issue. In fact, the opposite has been true. <clears throat> um, so with regards to the, the hormones, we know progesterone is not absorbed via the digestive tract. Uh, in birth control pills, it's used, uh, they use a synthetic form, or it's absorbed via the skin um, for other treatments. Um, the estradiol content, um, was found to be, again, 9.35 nanograms per gram, which compared to a low-dose birth control pill, and if we compare apples to apples, we're comparing 20,000 nanograms versus 9. Uh, even if a person is taking 10 grams of placenta a day, which most aren't, most are taking significantly less, more like 3 or 5, <coughs> 
It's still far too low to affect breastfeeding. Um, it also, placenta also contains uh, human placenta lacti lactogen, which mimics the action of prolactin. And of course, it is the biological norm, and to deviate from that um, would be uh, having the question be put in the other direction. What happens when we don't eat our placentas? Um, another big uh, question and controversy that comes up is reintoxication. People ask me this all the time when they're not asking me to actually encapsulate their placenta. <laughs> they're asking me, won't it just reintoxicate me? Isn't the placenta the, um, the organ that prevents the baby from getting toxins? And do they all stick in the placenta and then you, you consume it? So what I did is I compared a study that um, as the quantities of cadmium, mercury, and lead in, uh, I believe these are, yes, less wet weights of placenta versus Health Canada uh, standards. <coughs> um, I used Health Canada because I'm in Canada, of course. You can do your own comparison if you feel like it for your own country. Um, well, this last link uh, that you see in uh, this beautiful aqua color is clickable. Uh, the others are not. <sighs> Government websites, in my experience, tend to um, change the URLs for all their information about every two weeks. <laughs> so, but they are searchable um, on, um, on uh, the Health Canada website. So in the case of Cadmium, Health Canada set the maximum acceptable concentration for cadmium in drinking water at five parts per billion. The researchers found um, in different placentas, the average was from one to six part per billion. So if you were uh, consuming as much placenta in a day as you do water, it's possible you're drinking too much cadmium. You're consuming too much cadmium, although uh, it's not possible. <coughs> There's not as much um, a placenta in and of itself is probably in the neighborhood of 500 grams, not um, a couple of liters. Um, they also came up with an acceptable daily intake, which came to 57,000 to 7,100 nanograms per day. As far as mercury goes, uh, the um, maximum limit for fish, for mercury content of fish is 0.5 parts per million or 500 parts per billion in retail fish as compared to what they found, the researchers found in the placenta, which was 2 to 13 parts per billion. Um, and then um, lead, what Health Canada found is that most people are consuming about 100 nanograms of lead per kilo of their body weight. So if you weigh uh, a nice 70 kilos, you're looking at 7,000 nanograms per day. And the placenta contains 5 to 60 um, per gram. So reintoxication um, from a heavy metal perspective is, um, is not an issue from my perspective. Questions? This is uh, uh, my questions. <laughs> and we'll get to your questions in just a second. <clears throat> um, there are uh, a lot of questions go around. There's a lot of things we don't know about modern placenta phagy. <clears throat> uh, some of them come up over and over again. Uh, is it okay to encapsulate your placenta or eat your placenta when there is medication used during pregnancy? We don't have the answers to this. We, I usually do a quick math and think if this much got through and is still in your placenta and then you divide it by say the 200 capsules um, and you take three days, it doesn't end up being a whole lot per dose. Um, that, but again, we go, always go back to uh, risk versus benefit. Is the risk too large? <clears throat> Is the benefit not good enough? <clears throat> uh, are there interactions between placenta and medications that are currently being used? We don't know. <clears throat> this is not something we have any idea about. We can only guess. And again, risk versus benefit. <clears throat> One that comes up that's a little more thought out is, is placenta phagy appropriate with hormonal, hormonally mediated cancers or other illnesses? We've seen that the, the 
the uh, hormone content in cooked placenta is pretty low. <clears throat> However, will it play an effect? What if you have uh, a hormonal, hormonally mediated cancer? Is it worth uh, the risk? Um, that's up to you um, um, and your own uh, opinion. Um, uh, hormonal, hormonally uh, me mediated illnesses, such as uh, the people who get um, <clears throat> uh, headaches with their with their menstrual cycle, is placenta phagy appropriate for people like that? Are they more likely to get headaches with <clears throat> as a side effect with placenta phagy? Maybe it's something we need to look at. Uh, I have two pages of uh, references that I'm just going to leave up for a bit. And in the transfer, it, they lost their um, italicized words. <laughs> Sorry about that. And then I have one more slide after this one. And then uh, we'll take questions. So the first link here on this slide is um, Jack Newman's site, because I figured talk about him, might as well pump up his clinic. It seems to be a good place where a lot of people get a lot of help. Uh, Placentation.ucsg.edu is where I got the uh, pictures and permissions to use them. Um, uh, this guy collects uh, or collected um, uh, mammalian placenta information as well as pictures. And then there's my contact information. And over to the right, just to leave things loose, um, <laughs> loose and happy. <laughs> <laughs> Placenta, baby's first roommate. These are lapel pins you can wear, and they're at iheartguts.com. Uh, so that's pretty much it for for me. Um, I'm ready to uh, take any questions if there are any. I see there are. Okay, questions. well, it looks like. Thank you very much. That was very interesting um, presentation, and it looks like we've got about. Um, you know, seven or eight minutes here for questions, and a couple of things came up in the chat room. Um, I don't know, Denise, if um, if we really have the time to cover the relationship between beta endorphins and placental opioids. Um, Sarah, do you feel like uh, commenting on that at all, or is that uh, you know, kind of beyond the scope? I think off the top response. Yeah, it, it's uh, there's not a lot we have on what is um, um, what has been researched uh, with regards to placenta that's already cooked and or encapsulated, dried. Um, there's almost no information. I basically found one study, study, and then historical references. So, from a historical references point of view, I see this question about what's left uh, in the final form. Um, mm -hmm. And no, we're not, we're not certain of everything. We're just, we are certain that people have been doing this forever. Um, and that it has medicinal usage. <clears throat> OK, so the, the um, information that you did have in terms of the mercury and lead and um, That was wet, wet weight, so it was prior. Was on dehydrated placentas or was on unprocessed placentas? Uh, the uh, mercury, cadmium, and lead it was unprocessed. Okay. And then what about the estradiol and the other hormones, placental lactogen? Was that also raw or was that? Uh, the first half of that slide uh, with uh, estradiol, uh, progesterone, uh, testosterone, and human growth hormone, I believe, it was uh, processed placenta. Yep. And so already okay. cooked and dehydrated. So mm -hmm. it is still there in uh, small quantities, but it's still there. Okay, so Claudia Booker is asking if you can put up, I guess, the reference slide again. The resource ones are still up, but Claudia, were you interested in the references? So there's two pages of references here. Um, mm -hmm. the, maybe I can point something out more specifically. Non-human mammals. Uh, you'll see two, Chris, Mark Crystal, he has some interesting stuff. Um, Placentophagia and human and non-human mammals. Uh, and then I'll back up one to the other page of references. Um, 
So I, I'm, I'm really sorry if anybody has the same last name. I'm, I'm about to butcher it. It starts with an I. Y. <clears throat> Iyengar. There's two studies. Human placenta is dual biomarker for monitoring for monitoring fetal fetal and maternal environment, um, with special reference to potentially toxic trace elements. There's a part two and a part three that I used for this. So the toxic trace elements as well as um, minor trace and non-essential elements in human placenta. Those were they called a wet weight. <clears throat> they were not processed. So it's to know if raw also includes frozen. Sorry? The Denise Hand wants to know if raw ingestion includes frozen pieces. Some people do use frozen pieces. Yeah, some people, okay. like, there's so many different things you can do, and there's so many different things that placenta ladies do. A lot of people uh, will cut up the placenta into small pieces and then freeze it to use in smoothies. Um, there's a, People are really creative. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Melissa um, is commenting that... Um, for an area for research comparing um, raw versus cooking and dehydrated placenta. And then also Marinac is also looking at um, studies on composition of dehydrated. But I think that's been addressed. There you talked about um, you know, the values in dehydration. Um, it, an interesting thing is okay. coming up, people are asking about studies and uh, as Rian states here, there are a long list of studies that everyone wants to do. Um, there's not a lot of money behind it. <laughs> However, the uh, UNLV is in the middle of um, a double-blind study um, about uh, placenta encapsulation. Mm -hmm. And they're saying they're going to have results mm -hmm. as early as next year. Okay, well, we'll stay tuned then. And then Stephanie wanted to know more about uh, cultural um, associations. Has, has there been a specific culture that, um, that was the norm to engage in placenta fashion? You know, the thing is, it's, it's suspiciously absent. There's, there's one of these studies is called a suspicious absence, absence or at least discusses it. There, at some point, <laughs> In our history, we pretended like this never happened. So a lot of this information has been lost, at least on a paper kind of, uh, from a paperwork viewpoint. Um, traditional Chinese medicine is the one that does have uh, written accounts of using placenta since kind of forever. It was written since the 1600s. Um, presumably it was written because they'd been doing it for a while, if not forever as well as the uh, French text, which discusses it as, as, if, uh, as if it's it goes without saying that we've done this forever. Mm. But as far as written accounts, that's what we have. OK, well, that's a pretty um, broad spectrum from European to Chinese. So mm. I think um, the, that does You've done a good job of looking at the breadth of the evidence. Um, any final questions before we wrap up the presentation? Here? Well, I see this one about memory. Oh, memory is to hear perineal tears. Okay, that's a good one. A lot of people do a lot of things. That's definitely within the scope of possibility. I didn't even deal with anything cosmetic. There are a lot of cosmetic usages too. Um, human placental extracts is the word they use in um, a study I have here somewhere. Um, about uh, general laceration repair, where they lacerated people and then used human placental extracts um, and found that they caused healing to happen faster. So membranes or even a piece of placenta itself is not outside of the, the um, um, a possibility of something to do. Um, I'm sure people have done it. Great. Well, thank you so much for um, contributing this thank you. information to the conference. Some people encapsulate the membranes too, yes. Mm -hmm.